Uh, well, I just got a call from the Civic Suite, and they want one of our patients to transport to the operating room in 60 minutes. <laughs> now, on the day of surgery, we have interventions that are geared towards ensuring patient safety. Can you show me where we can find our um, responsibilities and interventions? It's in the preoperative checklist. Let's see. Okay. And we send the preoperative checklist along with the patient chart down to the operating room. Very good. And did you confirm the doctor's orders for the surgery? Uh, yes, I did. Let's see. It should be here in Detroit. Right here? There it is. Uh, everything's okay? Looks good? Good. Very good, Mark. Okay. okay. Let's go get our patient ready for surgery. Okay. Got everything? Yep. Good. Hello, Mrs. Rogers. Hi. Oh, you know my husband, David. What are you from? Uh, uh, yes, we've got a hard one. Good to see you again. Good morning. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Oh, this is my nursing instructor, Miss Scott. And we're just going to go over the last checklist to make sure everything's been done before surgery. Okay. Good. Okay. First, I'm just going to confirm the information on your ID bracelet. Very make good. Make sure that everything's correct. It is. Thank you. Now I'm just going to check the consent forms and make sure that they are signed, witnessed, and correct. Okay. Which they are. Now I'm just going to uh, take a look at the patient chart okay. and make sure that all the medical records are in order. Good. And they are. Well, I crossed my T's and dotted my I's. <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> okay, now the OR called, and they will be ready for you soon. So there's just a few things that we need to do before you're ready to go. Shoot. Well, first thing, Mrs. Rogers, we're going to take your vital signs and to assist you with any personal oral hygiene you need, okay? Excellent. I need to ask you to get out of your personal clothing and put on a hospital gown, okay? Okay, all right. <laughs> Okay, well, we have your vitals. Now we just need to go through our checklist. Um, do we have to remove any prosthetic devices? I'm all natural. Okay, um, dentures? Yeah, like I said, all natural. Okay. Makeup or finger polish? Nope. Okay. Hair pins or hair pieces? All natural. She is all natural. <laughs> so, no body piercing. Well, I do have this. No. <laughs> no. Um, Great, but well, what you do have are those eyeglasses and mm -hmm. your bracelet. And your ring. You know what? We can store them in our hospital security department or safe because we have to make a disposition of them before sending you to surgery anyway. It's so okay. Are you sure? Yeah, it's okay. Are you sure? Uh, thank you can hold them for me. Oh, okay, okay, great. Sure. Okay. And Mrs. Rogers, you've been to the ladies' room to empty your bladder, correct? I have. Okay, wonderful. Okay. And I've also noted any allergies according to policy. Good. And I've also checked to see if we have to administer any other preoperative medications Good. that may have been prescribed by the physician or the anesthesiologist. So we're in prescribed? Nope. No? We don't. No. Okay. So all we need to do is check the identification between the chart and ID band with the transport person and then we'll be ready to go. Okay. Okay? Great. Mark, I'm going to move this out of your way. Okay. Hello, Ms. Rogers. My name is Brendan. I'll be transporting you to the OR. Okay. Can I see your ID bracelet? Sure. And your name? And Helen Rogers. Okay. Can I move this in the stretcher? Sure. Yeah, I'm just going to put the side rail up for you. Okay. And I'm going to cover you up. All right. You stay in the stretcher now, all right? <laughs> I think I'll be okay. Good. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, Mark. Mark now is a good time for you to talk to David and tell him what he needs to do, okay? okay. All right. You know what that is, don't you? Mm -hmm. Sure. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Go talk to him. Go ahead. Uh, David, excuse yeah. me. Uh, um, your wife will be spending some time in the post-operative recovery area after surgery before coming back here. And... Uh, the surgical waiting room is down the hallway to the left, and Ms. Scott will actually take you there. Okay, fine. Okay, and um, the surgeon will meet with you in the waiting area after the operation just to speak with you. Great. Okay? Yeah. So, David, why don't you wait for me in the hallway, and I'll be with you shortly, okay? Okay. 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 So, Mark, while I am escorting David to the waiting room, what I need for you to do is to prepare Ms. Rogers' room for post-operative care, right? Mm -hmm. And that's even the post
can stop that every day. Right. Okay. Oh, also, um, for you to anticipate any needs for special equipment, depending on the type of surgery she's receiving, and by looking at her medical history. Right. Okay. Do you know what these are? Um, this would be any equipment uh -huh. to check vital signs. Good. Good. Um, deliver oxygen mm -hmm. or administer IV fluid. Wonderful. Okay, so I'll be right back. Okay. You get this done. Okay. I will. See you in a minute. Okay. Alright, so now we're in chapter 19 on the, um, and we're talking about intraoperative nursing now. And so we know that the intraoperative phase is when the patient is transferred to the operating table and it ends when the patient is transferred to the PACU. And so the members of the surgical team for the, um, well, the members of the surgical team, of course, we have the patient, we have the circulating nurse, the scrub roll, the surgeon, the um, registered nurse first assistant, the anesthesiologist, and the nurse anesthetist. And so, of course, we know that we have to have a patient, um, and we know that what's most important at this time is making sure that we have, that the person has made an informed decision to have surgery. So what I'm going to do is pause here for just a second and give you an opportunity to do um, chapter 19 pre-lecture quiz. Okay, so, question. You can answer this one. Um, true or false, the circulating nurse is responsible for monitoring the surgical team. Okay. True. It is the circulating nurse's job to circulate, to make sure that everything um, is being done to protect the patient's safety and well-being. Okay, and so we talked about some of the things that the circulating nurse will, um, is responsible for. So when we talk about the prevention of infection, the first thing we said, one of the questions we had, that safety is of utmost importance. Really, safety is most, is most important in the preoperative, intraoperative, postoperative period, making sure that we ensure safety. One of the ways that we ensure safety is to make sure that we do everything we can to prevent a postoperative infection in our patient. And so the first thing we have to do is make sure that we're doing, um, um, taking those preventative strategies in the surgical environment. And so your book talks about the three zones in the um, surgical suite. And so you have the unrestricted zone. Unrestricted means you can wear whatever you want to. There, we're not really worried about infection in this part. But then we have the semi-restricted zone. And in the semi-restricted zone, this is where <clears throat> scrubs are required in the semi-restricted zone. And then it's in the restricted zone, then we have our full surgical garb. Um, anybody that's gonna be sterile, um, this person has performed a surgical scrub, scrubbing the skin, trying to um, eliminate any microbes from the skin. We've covered everything that needs to be covered. Hair, we, um, we've covered hair, um, beards, we've covered shoes. Of course, we're going to cover um, our, our outside clothes, not our outside clothes, but our scrubs we have on our surgical gowns. And so in the restricted zone, we want to try to keep this area as sterile as possible. Now we do have areas within the surgical suite that are considered unsterile and we'll talk more about that. And so when we talk about surgical asepsis, this is the removal of microorganisms to prevent contamination of surgical wounds. And so what was one of the, way, the ways that we did that in the preoperative period? We removed excess hair. What else? Made sure the patient had had an AM bath. Made sure that they had a bath. That was one of the way that, one of the ways that we prepared the skin for the person going into the um, uh, um into the um surgical suite. So we want to help to remove those microorganisms to prevent contamination of the surgical wound. You have a person that's dirty that hasn't taken a bath. When the physician goes in, the surgeon goes in to make an incision, he's pushing bacteria into that open incision, right? So we want to make sure that the skin has been prepped. And one of the ways that we do that is making sure they have a bath. Now, depending on the procedure, the person may have another um, um, preparation of the skin, maybe with a, I'm, 
iodine preparation. I'm not sure what they use in the surgical um, in the surgical suite, but they may prep the skin again before any incisions are gone, before any incisions are made. Um, when we talk about the restricted zone, this is where um, a place where only scrub personnel are required. Um, the book talked about artificial nails. Um, it went to, you know, a good amount of detail. Artificial nails are not um, allowed at all in the surgical suite. But what I wanted to add to that is that not only... Not only are they not allowed in the surgical suite, they're not allowed in the nursing program, period. And so we'll have students sometimes that will tell me, you know, well, I don't have artificial nails. I just have an overlay. I have, you know, it's something just overlaying the nails now where it's not an artificial nail, but it is something that's artificially covering your natural nail. So none of those things um, we don't. We um, tell you to remove all nails, all overlays um, in the nursing program because not only are artificial nails a risk in the surgical environment, they're also a risk out on the floor. If we're not cleaning those nails properly, things get underneath your, get between your nail and that overlay, and so you put your patient at risk when you have artificial nails. So we don't allow them in the nursing program at all. When we talk about environmental controls, your book talked. About about the different type of air quality devices that are used within the OR. The reason we use these different these different types of devices is because we want to keep clean, the air as clean as possible and circulate bacteria out of that surgical suite because we know that we have microorganisms floating in the air, right? Okay, and so those microorganisms that are suspended in the air can lodge or become, you know, find themselves in the surgical wound. So we have different, the book talked about different qual, different air quality um, devices that are used. It appears from reading in your book that the laminar, um, the laminar um, air quality machine, um, it decreases most of the colony forming units that are in the air, that are suspended in the air. And it says in your book that with these, when these type of units are used, that the infection rate is less than 1%. And so that is really good. What your book talked about is even though, you know, we do what we need to and we take baths, we shed skin cells with every movement. And we have to take account for that in the surgical suite. You know, we talked about putting things on our heads and, you know, covering ourselves. But when we're talking, with the book talked about the person having on masks. Everybody needs to have on the mask that's going to be around that patient because, of course, we know we talk and spit saliva. And it's not really clean, right? <laughs> so we have to make sure that we're wearing a mask at all times when we're in the surgical suite because we're trying to decrease the amount of bacteria that are in the air. So when we look at the basic guidelines for surgical asepsis, you may remember these things from um, fundamentals, but if you don't, we're going to make sure that you remember them. All materials in contact with the wound, all materials within the sterile field must be sterile. Not unsterile, not clean, not clean, sterile. Okay? So anything coming in contact with the wound must be sterile. It says here that the sterile gown in front from the chest level above to um, from the chest level of the sterile field up. That's the only sterile sterile part of the person in the surgical suite. If you think about it, I can control, I see what's going on here. I don't see what's going on here. My leg may have bumped one of the legs of the table. That part isn't sterile. If usually the rule of thumb is if you can't see it, it's not sterile. That's why it says that the front from the chest is sterile. The back, we consider the back are sterile. I can't see the back. I can't see my back. I don't know what's going on. I don't know what I brushed up against with my booty. Okay? So the front of the chest is considered sterile. From the chest up, it's considered sterile. And it says that from my elbow to the cuff, that area is considered sterile. Okay? So it also says only top, the top of the drape table is considered sterile, only the top part. During draping, the drape must be held um, above, uh, well above the area and placed from front to back. 
items dispensed um, by methods, items should be dispensed by methods to preserve sterility. And so I know I can't show this for my people that are listening to this by integrity, but what we usually do with packages when we're opening a package for the surgeon or for one of the people of his surgical team, we open that package away from us. And when you're reading in your book, it tells you about open packages. And so once we open a package, it said that the edges of that package, we now consider that sterile, um, to be unsterile. And so what we do, we try to not come into contact with the inside of this package as much as possible. We're going to open this away from us, and we open it in a manner to where I can go to my surgeon, and he can pull that out without making any contact with the inside of that package, okay? We want him to be able to easily just pick, just pull it out. Be able to pull that out, but make no contact with this package, okay? So that's how we open a mess, open a package in a method to preserve sterility. Um, what it says here also, movements of the surgical team should be, should be sterile to sterile and from unsterile to unsterile. If you're unsterile, don't come on the sterile part. And if you're sterile, stay in the sterile part, okay? Once you're sterile and you go to unsterile, you're unsterile. So if you're um, part of the surgical team and you're sterile, you stay there, unsterile is unsterile. A circulating nurse is considered unsterile. And so all she's doing is making rounds. She's looking around because your book says that a foot away from, maybe a foot away from that operating table, that's our sterile area. A foot is not a lot of room, okay? And so that's our sterile area. The circulating nurse is not coming in that area. And if you think about it, that's not, uh, you know, that's not too far for the circulating nurse to be able to observe what's going on, okay? So the reason I bought gloves in is because I don't know if you remember from last semester how to sterile glove, so I just wanted to practice it again really quickly. We'll take maybe about five minutes practicing our sterile gloves. Here's the kicker. I got six and a half, and so I think maybe I'm about a seven and a half. So we're just going to practice to make sure that we know how to put on sterile gloves because when we um, do Foley's, we have to use sterile gloves, and you have to be able to um, do it correctly. And what I see a lot of my students doing, they just forget when you're sterile, you're sterile, so you can't pick this package up again and move it, okay? So just make sure that you remember when you're doing anything that requires sterile glove and that you remember that you're sterile. So there are very few things that you can touch at that point once you're sterile, okay? So let's go ahead and pause this for just a second. Good job. All right, so we've already talked about um, some of our principles of sterility. We talked about the circulating nurse, knowing that she is considered unsterile and she remains in the unsterile area. Um, also, um, movement around the sterile field must not cause contamination of the field. At least one foot distance from the sterile field must be maintained. We talked about that, that one foot distance and that area is considered sterile. When sterile when a sterile barrier is breached, the area is considered contaminated. And so the book talked about maybe if a part of the drape, if we um, put something um, non-sterile on the part of the drape, we can come back and put a sterile drape over that part that's become contaminated. Okay. Um, when a sterile barrier, um, we just said that, um, every, every sterile field is considered maintained um, while it's monitored. Now, um, when it's not monitored, then we, you know, question the sterility of a field that we have not monitored. Um, we talk about insects. Things can land on a sterile field, okay? Um, we talk about dust, you know? Um, so if, a f if that's the reason this last statement, sterile fields are prepared as close as possible to the time of use because if we prepare it too far ahead of time, we're not there to necessarily monitor that sterile field, and we don't know when micro or you know when things have landed on it. Like I said, maybe a fly. Um, we don't know. Um, I don't know. Maybe the dust has blown something over to that area. The air um, current in the room has blown something to that area. So we want to make sure that we're preparing that sterile field as close as possible to the actual t actual time, so that we're maintaining sterility. But again, whenever you're in doubt about the sterility, 
just consider it to be unsterile and get a new one. Okay. All righty. <laughs> so, um, as I said, we talk about the roles of the um, surgical team. We already talked about the surgical, um, about the circulating nurse. When I read about the circulating nurse, the circulating nurse seems like the ultimate manager and patient advocate because she's making sure that you do everything to make sure that that patient is safe. She's going to chart when you give medication. She's going to chart the time, the end time, the, the start time, the end times. She's looking at everybody that's around that sterile field to make sure that they, they are not breaking sterile technique. She's making sure that they're not using items that have become contaminated. She's making sure that the patient is positioned correctly. Um, and so, again, she is, like I said, the patient advocate. She's that manager to make sure that everything that's done to that patient is done in a safe and effective manner. I have a question. Yes. If sterility is broken, does she document that? If sterility is broken, the procedure? I don't know how we would want to say that. Mm -hmm. I know she would mention it, but would we write down that we broke sterile technique? I don't know. I, I don't know about that one. Yeah, so I don't I don't know. I just have to be honest about that one. I'm sure that like whatever hospital you were at or whatever sir, they probably would tell you they would tell you what they what they prefer if something like that happened. Mm -hmm. so you would know how to document it for that particular place. Because I'm sure they have it ain't on the test. We ain't gonna worry about it. Well, I mean. <laughs> I don't know because you know you have to be so cautious now in how you chart things and you know you can't say that a person fell. Um, you have to say you know maybe patient found at bedside. It, there's so many things you just have to be so careful in what you put in the chart. So if a per if there was a break in sterile technique, I just wonder you know if it's something maybe you know maybe if. It's something as small as a four by four being put in the area that's contaminated, and the physician is about to use it. That's something so small, and the person hasn't been impacted by that yet. If we catch it as a circulating nurse, and we change our gloves and get a new gauze, do we really have to chart that? So, I mean, I'm just I'm not real clear about that part. Um, with the scrub roll. Um, the book was good in that it didn't say nurse behind here because, as you saw, um, uh, what you will see when you read, that the person operating in the scrub role can be a nurse. Um, also, the person can be an LPN or the person can be um, a certified um, surgical assistant, um, a surgical technologist is what your book calls them. And so the um, purpose of the scrub is that they anticipate and they prepare the supplies based on the procedure. And a another note that I put down here, with time, that scrub person will um, prepare things based on the specifications of that surgeon. And so they'll say, oh, no, Dr. Jones, he likes this type of forcep, he likes this, he likes that. And so whereas you may have a list of things that you know you need for a particular procedure, with time, you begin to learn what a particular surgeon likes. You know, the procedure may call for two sets of two sets of sutures or whatever, saying, well, no, he's going to use three and he's going to use one set to do this. So it's just with time you, you begin to learn what's needed for a specific procedure, and you also learn the specifications of the different surgeons that you'll be working with. Also, one of the re um, responsibilities of the person operating is this, in the scrub role is to count instruments and to count sponges. And so in your book it says that we perform a sponge count once at the beginning, and we count sponges twice at the end, okay? And needles. And needles. Equipment, needles, instruments. Um, 
with the registered nurse first assistant, this is a person that is at the bedside with the physician. And so the registered nurse first assistant may, op may assist the surgeon with suturing. Maybe the person is holding the heart out of the way. Maybe the person is displacing organs. Um, maybe the um, registered nurse first assist is there to apply pressure um, to stop bleeding. And so the person, the registered nurse first assistant is at the bedside with the surgeon. Also, so a registered nurse first assistant, we have physician assistants. You have surgical uh, physician assistants, and sometimes they're operating in this role where you see um, operating in the role as a registered nurse first assistant. Okay. Um, of course, we have the anesthesiologist. This is the doctor, and um, the anesthetist is the nurse. Okay. Your um, certified registered nurse anesthetist, and then the anesthesiologist is this is the anesthetist boss okay and so you may have an anesthesiologist that starts the medication or you have nurse nurse anesthetists that also administer the medication so really i have a hard time understanding why i understand the difference i understand that one is a physician but anytime i've been to the hospital i talk to a nurse anesthetist i don't remember the anesthesiologist so um, but the anesthesiologists do know that this person has a MD degree. This is a medical doctor, and your anesthetist is a nurse anesthetist. Um, the role of the nurse is as patient advocate, which we've said before, to make sure that all the needs of the patient are being met while they are unable to speak for themselves and make decisions for themselves. You have a nurse that's acting as advocate on that patient's behalf. So intraoperative complications, things that can happen in the operating room. Um, the person may experience nausea and vomiting with the induction of the anesthesia. And so we have a person that's becoming nauseated and vomiting. What do we do? Well, yeah, we can lay them on their side. We can also have suction available at bedside to suction this patient. Um, we know that if a person um, aspirates, then they're at a risk for pneumonia. So we want to make sure that we're prepared um, in case in the um, case that the person becomes nauseated and vomits. Um, anaphylaxis. Um, the thing about anaphylaxis is when we're doing our preoperative assessment, we should assess for allergies at this time. Ask the person, have you ever had any reaction to latex or any reaction to medications? The other side of that is, though, what if you have an allergy that you didn't know about mm -hmm. and you're allergic or you have an allergic response to the anesthesia that they're giving you? The thing about allergies is, and anaphylaxis is that it's good when the person is alert because they can tell you, my throat mm -hmm. feels like it's tightening up or you know you can see those other systemic things that happen this isn't so when the person has already received anesthesia and they're asleep they can't say my, my throat is feeling tight something something's going on here something doesn't feel right the person can't tell you that when they're asleep so we have to know what to look for that may be signs that the person is having an anaphylactic reaction and one of the things is monitoring a person's vital signs if a person is having an anaphylactic reaction one of the things that happens they're going to have some airway problems okay this airway starts to close up and they're not going to be able to exchange oxygen oxygen the way that they normally have another thing that happens with anaphylaxis is that the body the vessels in the body start to vasodilate so so what happens with vasodilation is that the blood pressure drops. And so this is one of those things that the circulating nurse, again, is paying attention to. Why is this person blood pressure dropping? The physician hadn't done anything, hadn't opened them up. There's, there shouldn't be a risk for bleeding at that point. So why is the blood pressure dropping and we haven't done anything? Okay. And so why is the O2 set dropping? So these could be signs of an anaphylactic reaction. Okay. The person is at risk for hypoxia. Um, we know that anesthesia relaxes everything, and it also depresses the respiratory system, okay? And so we already talked about fluid and electrolytes and acid-base balance. So what happens if I can't properly <coughs> inhale and exhale? The exchange between carbon dioxide and oxygen is affected. Mm -hmm. And so if my ventilations become too low, what happens? 
We can develop acidosis, right? We can develop acidosis, and we can also develop some hypoxia. Hypoxia is because we're not getting in enough oxygen because we're not breathing enough, okay? So we have to monitor for hypoxia. One of the ways that we do this in the intraoperative period, the person is continually being monitored by pulse ox, monitoring the person's um, oxygen saturation. Um, with hypothermia, this can happen because of the environment, of the um, O2 environment it is very cold. The reason that it is very cold, because microorganisms tend to thrive in a warm environment. And so to discourage the growth of bacteria and microorganisms, ORs are very, very cold. Okay? And so... Um, as a result of the cold environment, the person is at risk for hypothermia. Also, the book talks about you're opening the, the person's body, okay? So when those incisions are made um, to access those organs, well, then you're um, increasing the person's risk of hypothermia. Also, the irrigating solutions that may be used to, you know, clear that area so it's not, you know, full of blood. If those solutions are not warmed, again, you can cause the person's core body temperature to drop and the person is at risk for hypothermia. Usually what happens when we're really cold is that we shiver. That's not a good thing on the operating table. Okay, So we want to make sure that we're monitoring the person's body temperature. The book talks about um, gradual rewarming. If the temperature drops below 98 degrees, then the person may need gradual rewarming. With malignant hypothermia, this is one of those conditions that your book talked about. It looks like it's the person has a genetic predisposition to um, developing malignant hypothermia. We usually see it sometimes with our people, with our men that have um, that are really muscular. Um, but what happens is that it's um, a malignant hypothermia. The person body temperature goes up as a result of receiving um, different type of anesthetic agents. And so what we're monitoring a person for um, with hypo malignant hypothermia is a temperature spike. However, I was reading in another book about malignant hypothermia, and the temperature spike is one of the things that you see later. Yeah. It's not one of the things that you see Initially, the thing that you see initially with malignant hypothermia is the tachycardia, okay? And so, again, we have a person, we know this person has been anesthetized, and the heart rate goes up. No type of surgery has been done yet. What might be going on with our patient? And so the person could have malignant hypothermia. What becomes a problem with malignant hypothermia, the book talks about um, altered um, calcium function. And so the person has altered calcium function, meaning calcium is not doing its job. It's being inhibited from doing its job properly. And so you have those signs and symptoms of hypocalcemia. The book says that when a person has malignant hypothermia, if this is not caught, this person is probably going to die. Okay? We think about um, hypocalcemia, and remember we said calcium was that stimulus that told the heart to contract. So when we have a person that has problems with malignant hypothermia, well, calcium is not doing its job, and we know that it can affect the heart, okay? The person has those symptoms of tetany that we talked about. They're going to have some problems with dysrhythmia. So these are all the things that we're going to watch for, but we know tachycardia is going to be one of the earliest signs that we see with malignant hypothermia. So, again, it's important in the preoperative period to assess the person for any type of allergies. Um, we've got to make sure, again, we're monitoring the person for any changes in the blood pressure. Is the blood pressure dropping? Is there a decrease in the O2 set? Um, this, um, when a person has um, malignant hypothermia and we catch it, the medication that we give for that is called Dantrium, D-A-N-T-R-I-U-M. -I 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 this is the medication that's given for malignant hypothermia, and what it does is that it slows muscle, it, um, it's going to help with that muscle contraction, and it's going to help with metabolism. 
with malignant, excuse me, with malignant hypertension, your book says it's hypermetabolism. And so that dashrim is going to help with that increased metabolism. Okay, so true or false, the most frequent early sign for a patient um, at risk for malignant hypothermia to general anesthesia is bradycardia. False. It's going to be tachycardia. Okay, so um, potential adverse effects of surgery and anesthesia. Um, allergic reactions, we already talked about those, drug toxicity and reactions. In the preoperative um, lecture, we talked about reactions that can occur um, with different medications, and then we add the anesthesia and possible complications that our person can have as a result of that. Um, cardiac dysrhythmias um, are possible. Um, if the person has an electrolyte disturbance, the person can have cardiac dysrhythmias. There could be CNS changes. Over sedation and under sedation is possible with um, with anesthesia. So over sedation is a problem and under sedation is a problem. Why do you think under sedation is a problem? You're not sedated, and so you feel the you can feel some stuff and you can hear some stuff. So under sedation is a problem, and of course over sedation is going to be a problem because it's going to further de depress the central nervous system, the respiratory system. Um, affect the ability of the heart. So um, over sedation is not a problem. I mean, over sedation is a problem. Um, hypotension is a problem. Um, with hypotension, you have a, re a relaxation of blood vessels or vasodilation, and the person's blood pressure drops. And so that is not a good thing because we know that we need blood to perfuse all of our organs and to keep them alive. So um, hypotension is a, is a possible side effect or of anesthesia. So again, we're monitoring the person's blood pressure. The person's blood pressure drops too low, then what are we going to do? We can give the person vasopressors. We can give them medications that help increase the blood pressure. We can also increase the person IV fluids may need to be increased. May have a person that, that's lost too much blood, and it's time to call for that blood that was on hold for the patient. Okay, so we're going to monitor for hypotension. We're going to monitor for um, thrombosis. Um, we know thrombosis occurs as a result of blood, blood pooling in one area for an extended period of time. We do know with longer surgeries that a patient may be in a position for hours, okay? So it's going to increase the person's risk for thrombosis because, you know, they're asleep. They can't do those do those leg exercises that we talked about. And, of course, we're not going to come in and do range of motion on a patient during surgery, okay? So they're at risk for thrombosis. Um, trauma up here, it says, including burns. We have to make sure that we're monitoring for, for those things. We know we have more laparoscopic surgeries being done. Okay, and so the person is at risk for nerve, um, for damage from, um, I mean, is at risk for burns. Um, laryngeal and oral trauma can occur when the person is being intubated, and so we may see more effects of that after the surgery in the post-operative period. Also, nerve damage can occur if the person has been incorrectly positioned for a long period of time. So, um... All of these things are potential adverse effects of surgery and anesthesia. So in your book, it talked about the different types of anesthesia and sedation. And so you had a number of charts that talked about the different types of anesthetic agents that are used. Um, one of the things it said in your book is that anesthesia, anesthesia period is severe central nervous system um, depression. A person must have IV access in case a reversal agent is needed. Um, when we talk about general anesthesia, general anesthesia says that a person can receive um, gas inhalation or a IV um, or IV general anesthesia. Usually, we do these together. 
A person may have, uh, I may receive IV anesthesia, and they may receive inhalation anesthesia. So in the book, you did you, on your quiz, you had um, some questions about the medullary depression, which was stage four. What I wanted you to do is make sure that when you're reading about anesthesia, make sure that you understand the different stages of general anesthesia. And so your book talked about the four stages where you have beginning, the excitement phase, what, what usually happens with the excitement phase, Stage three, which was surgical anesthesia, and stage four is medullary depression. Usually, we don't want stage four. Okay, stage four is when the person has received too much anesthesia, and this is usually the phase that we do not want, and that we that is um, that's that the person wants to avoid, or the anesthesiologist wants to avoid. Um, when we talk about medullary depress, depression, you have to go back and remember the purpose of the medulla of the brain. So um, the medulla of the brain controls the cardiac centers, the vasomotor centers, and the respiratory centers of the brain. And so if we're depressing that, well, then we see everything that we're depressing. Okay? So we usually do not want medullary depression to occur. With generally, with all routine general anesthesia, it begins with IV induction, with the IV induction agent. Um, it produces a pleasant sleep with rapid onset. This allows time for endotracheal placement. I would want to be fully asleep before a person intubates me. And so usually, before the person receives the gas, they receive an IV anesthetic to relax them and to produce sleep before they're actually intubated. Once the person is intubated, then the person will receive, um, usually will receive gas at that point. Um, with inhalation, inhalation um, anesthetics, these are gases and these are volatile. Volatile means what? They can catch on fire, okay? And so inhalation, um, any type of gas, usually all gases are volatile and that there's a risk for fire. We want to review the different methods of delivering an anesthetic gas, which was on page 450. With IV um, anesthetics, these are non-volatile. Usually, as I said, they're going to be um, compact. Com, um, combined with the inhaled gas, and the advantage of the IV anesthetic is that there's less sensory involvement, meaning the person doesn't com complain of that buzzing and roaring um, that they would um, complain of with the gas. Um, also, with the IV anesthetics, you have um, vomiting and nausea that's going to be less common with the um, IV types. Now, when we look at the advantages of using an inhaled gas, um, the one of the advantages is that we take it in through the lungs and it's going to be excreted rapidly if the person is breathing the way that they need to, okay? So we breathe it in and we're going to breathe it out. So it's going to be rapidly excreted, okay? Um, one of the disadvantages of an inhaled gas is that it's a respiratory tract irritant. Okay, so you have, may have a person after surgery, this person is going to have more coughing, may have more laryngeal spasms. That's the, the um, larynx spasm. And so spasm means it's opening and closing. Um, and the person is going to have increased secretions. And we usually see this associated with medications that are inhaled. We also have um, regional anesthesia. And so regional anesthesia is um, an anesthetic agent injected around nerves set so that the entire region supplied by the nerves is anesthetized. Now with regional anesthesia, the person may be awake for regional anesthesia. And usually the two types that we're most familiar with when we talk about regional anesthesia is the epidural and spinal anesthesia. Um, I read these sections a couple of times, and really the only big difference that I can see between the epidural anesthesia and the spinal anesthesia is the location that the medication is being injected to. As far as the areas of the body that are regionally anesthetized, usually they, they can kind of do the same thing. Um, Usually with spinal anesthesia, it causes paralysis of the lower extremities, the perineum, and the lower abdomen. And so um, usually we see this being given to pregnant women. Okay? 
when they're about to give birth when they're in labor and so um, as I said they usually differ in the area in which they're going to the medication is going to be injected also um, the person more commonly has what's called a spinal headache when they have a spinal anesthesia one of the things I've heard that's done for that is what's called a blood patch and that usually helps to relieve a spinal headache um, with moderate sedation, um, this use, um, uses a sedative, and usually um, we give these to treat pain and to reduce anxiety. The respiratory centers are not usually affected by a moderate anesthesia, so the person is still able to, to breathe on their own without any intervention. Now, with our general anesthesia, most likely the person is going to have some type of intubation. Okay, Moderate sedation person is... Um, you know, still awake enough to where they can breathe on their own. They can still respond to verbal stimuli um, as needed. And with um, your local anesthesia, this is when the nerves around that area, that's when the areas, I'm sorry, the nerves to that immediate area are going to be um, affected, such as um, lidocaine. Um, some places are using lidocaine now for IV insertion. Okay, so just deaden the area into that area in the hand so the whole hand doesn't go to sleep. They inject a little lidocaine in that vein, and so that area becomes numb. And so that's what happens with local. If it was regional, this whole arm would be dead. Okay, so you see the difference between local and regional. Okay, some hospitals now will use lidocaine before we insert a Foley on a male patient. And so, again, we're just deadening, um, affecting the nerves in that immediate area. They put it at the, where did they stick it? They put it at the tip of the penis, at the urethral opening. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. No, it's not a, it's not a pen. No, it's not a pen. It's a lot of cane gel. I'm sorry. I should have said that. Yes, it would for the male. Okay, so through which route um, are general anesthetic agents eliminated? General anesthesia. Through the lungs. So usually with general anesthesia, we're talking about the gas. Okay. Now, if we were just talking about IV kidneys, we usually with general we're involving, it's involving gas, and so the lungs are going to be the primary way that they're going to be excreted. With our elderly patients, they are in, at increased risk for complications because they have coexisting conditions already. You may have a person that's already got diabetes, already got high blood pressure, some peripheral artery disease, um, coronary artery disease, so they may have coexisting conditions that are going to affect their post-operative post -operative recovery. You have an aging heart, um, pulmonary system, um, and so they may have changes in response to drugs, anesthetic agents, agents due to the um, aging process. Usually with our older patients, it's going to take a little bit longer for anesthesia to be eliminated from the system. So you may have an elderly patient, it's going to take them a little bit longer to wake up or to fully recover from anesthesia, though, you know, than it would somebody that's, you know, middle aged. In our intraoperative period, of course, hopefully at this point we've already reduced anxiety. We said that this is the period from when the person is on the operating room table to the person going to pack you. So usually by the time they hit the table, they should already be relaxed and anxiety should already be taken care of. We've already done our preoperative assessment to make sure that the person does not have a latex allergy. If the person does have a latex allergy, hopefully we've accounted for all of that before. We've used all latex-free products and make sure we've made sure that the, that the surgeon and the RN first assist all have latex-free gloves. Any angio caps that are used, they're all latex free. We've already done that in our preparation. Um, we're preventing intraoperative 
uh, positioning injuries, again, we said that the circulating nurse can help with that, making sure that our um, patient is properly positioned. Um, we're protecting the person from any injuries. We're serving as the patient advocate. We're monitoring and um, managing post-operative, um, managing potential complications. Again, making sure the circulate nurse is making sure that the environment is staying sterile. She's constantly monitoring the vital signs, looking for any decreases, any increases. We know what we're looking for with malignant hypertension, with malignant hypothermia. We know signs and symptoms that the blood pressure is dropping too low. Um, so we're looking for all those things. We're monitoring the vital signs. Um, a knowledgeable nurse knows about the side effects of the different type of the different anesthesia different anesthesia agents that are being used. Based on that, we know. If we're knowledgeable, knowledgeable about the different agents, if the person starts laughing, then it doesn't throw everybody off, okay? And so the knowledgeable nurse knows about the different signs and symptoms to expect with the induction of anesthesia. And so if we know that it causes twitching, we know to anticipate those things. And maybe we need to take um, time to allow the person to go through that period before that procedure is started. Now, one thing that I didn't mention, and it's not in my notes, is time out. And so, why? What is a time out procedure? Okay. So we're just stopping at that point before anything is done to the person. We're making sure that it's the right patient that it's the right procedure, that we have the right site mark, okay? All right? With um, surgery, these, the books, this um, chart is in your book. It just goes over the different types of positions that may be utilized um, in surgery. And so as you see here in A, this, um, shoot. It's just showing you the different positions. Now, what type of surgeries they may use these for? Really not sure. I think for D, this is a person that may be having a renal surgery. Lithotomy, of course, this is um, going to be a female surgery. Um, and Trendelenburg, hmm, I would have to look at that one a little bit more to see why they use Trendelenburg. Lower abdomen. Okay. All righty. And so protecting the patient from injury, again, we're going to make sure that we've identified um, the patient. We've got our consent form signed. Um, we verified um, records, the history and physical exam. We've looked at all diagnostic tests, any allergies. Um, we're monitoring the physical environment. We've made sure that all medical equipment to be used, all electrical equipment is effectively, is correctly grounded, um, plugged in correctly. We don't have any fraying wires being used. Um, and we verified that our blood is ready in the blood bank. Okay, so we want to do all of these things early in the intraoperative period to make sure that we don't have any complications during the actual surgery, okay? Okay, so now we're in Chapter 20 on post-operative nursing management. So um, we know that post-operative, um, the post-operative period is when? When does that begin? Okay. She's <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're saying post operative, we're getting the person in the post anesthesia care unit. Um, we've monitored them um, in the operating room. We're getting ready to transfer them out. So it's from that period to this person ultimately goes home. Okay, that's our post operative period. And so, our nursing management in the PACU, the post-anesthesia care unit, we want to provide care for the patient until the patient has recovered from the effects of anesthesia. Now, we said that anesthesia kind of relaxes everything. It's a central nervous system depressant. So, the lungs are sleepy, 
the heart is sleepy, the GI tract is sleepy. So during the post-operative period, we wanted to make sure that the person is starting to recover from the effects of anesthesia. The person is waking up some. They have, they've um, retained or um, began to breathe on their own better. The blood pressure is starting to stabilize, become more stable. So these are the things that we're looking for in the post-anesthesia, uh, in the post-anesthesia period. The patient has resumption of motor and sensory function. The person is oriented, the stable vital signs, and there's no evidence of hemorrhage or complications of surgery. All the different type of complications that we talked about. Hypotension, malignant hypo. Um, malignant hyperthermia. We've avoided or abated all those things. None of those things occurred. Vital signs are stable. Um, we've done our skilled assessment at this per of this person at this point. And so, when we talk about the phases, we have three phases of post anesthesia care. We have phase one, and during phase one, this is immediate, the immediate post-operative period. We're finished with the surgery, and so now we've got to um, monitor this person. We may do EKG at this point. Um, the goal of, of, of this phase is to prepare the person to be transferred to phase two. And so usually, um, when I was reading this book and comparing it to another book, it looks like phase one may occur when we're still in the operating room. We're making sure that this person is stable to transfer out to the post-anesthesia care unit, which is adjacent to the OR. We have to make sure that it's adjacent because just in case this person is not stable and they continue to have some bleeding, we got to get them back in, in surgery really quickly, okay? So the post-anesthesia care unit is outside of the operating room, and usually this can be considered phase two. So with phase two, if we have a person that has an ambulatory procedure, the goal in phase two is to prepare this person in phase two for transfer home, or if the person requires more monitoring, we're going to transfer this person out to the floor, or... If the person is not stable, then they're going to intensive care. But the goal of phase two is to transfer them from post-anesthesia care to either the home setting. They may be kept for 24-hour observation, and so this person is going to remain in the hospital for 24 hours to be observed. Or if the person is not stable, the person may be transferred to ICU. And so during phase three, in phase three, we're preparing this person that did not go home. We're preparing them for self-care to be transferred home at some point. Okay, So that's our goal in phase three, to prepare this person to care for themselves in the home care environment. When we look at the responsibilities of the PACU nurse, again, we're going to review pertinent information. This is where that baseline assessment information is going to be important. When we're doing our first, when we're doing our vitals, we have to have a baseline set of vitals to compare our new set of vitals to in the post-operative period. If the person has a decrease in blood pressure, we want to know what the beginning blood pressure was. Well, if the person has a spike in their blood pressure, was this a person that was hypertensive preoperatively anyway? Okay, so we want to know what our baseline was. If the person had a normal blood pressure, 120 over 80, and then the post-operative period, now we have a person that's 180 over 100, why the spike in the blood pressure? Something is going on with our patient. The person may, it may be simply that the person is having pain and it's affecting the blood pressure. So we need to have a baseline, okay? Of course, we're going to do our ongoing assessments. When the person comes out to us, we say ABCs. We're always looking for airway, right? And then the American Heart Association came out and said hands-only CPR. We're not even worried about the airway anymore. We're going straight for the heart, right? So 
we still teach airway is first though. So when the first person comes out to us, we're making sure that the airway is not blocked. We're making sure that the person um, is breathing appropriately. We're monitoring the person's respirations. We're um, assessing cardiovascular um, function. And so we know we do this by monitoring the person's blood pressure. We're going to assess the surgical site when the person comes out to us. We want to um, monitor the function or assess the function of the CNS. And how do we do that? Um, the, orientation. the orientation. Okay. All right, we can ask the person, you know, even if they're still a little groggy, we can, you know, the person may wake a little bit to say, I'm Miss Johnson, okay? We want to assess um, any IVs, all IV lines. We want to make sure that what we were given in report is what's actually hanging to our patient when they come out to us. We want to assess all tubes that the person may have come out with. The person may have come out with drains, and so we have to make sure that those drains are intact. Okay. Make sure that none of the tubes are obstructed because obstructed tubes don't drain and don't infuse. So we have to make sure that we're monitoring the tubes and any equipment that the patient may have come out of the OR with. We want to reassess vitals um, and reassess the patient status every 15 minutes or more frequently as needed. Usually post-op vitals will um, consist of monitoring the person every 15 minutes times four. So for the first hour, we're gonna monitor the person every 15 minutes. And then after that first hour, we're gonna monitor the person every 30 minutes for maybe an hour. And so this usually depends on the institution, but usually you do have the set of the set of 15, the four sets of 15, the two sets of 30, and then maybe the person will go to every four hours. So um, we want to provide report we're going to transfer the patient to another unit or discharge the patient to home. And so when we're providing report, we're letting the next nurse know everything to expect in order to take care of that patient. Now, in the video, we saw the nursing instructor and the student, and she said, we're going to prepare this room for this patient in the postoperative period based on anything that may have been going on with the patient before any um, any illnesses that the person may have come there with, and what do we expect this patient to need after surgery. And so when we're providing report to the next nurse, we're anticipating the needs of our patient, okay? As the receiver, we need to anticipate what our patient is going to need. Does that make sense? Okay. So we may anticipate the person may have some nausea and vomiting, so we may what? Go ahead, get an emesis basin. Usually, we can um, do suction. We can go ahead and set up oxygen, have our oxygen set up already. Um, usually, the patient is going to come back with IV fluids. So, it's good to go ahead and run throughout the hospital and check all the rooms for an IV pump because sometimes they're hard to come by. But we want to prepare our room and make sure that we have an IV pump ready for our patient that's going to come back. Okay. If we need extra pillows, we're going to make sure that we have those things. And so we're going to already prepare our room for our patient that's coming. Now, as the person that's giving report, you want to make sure that you're providing the nurse with all the information needed to take care of this patient. What type of procedure did the person have? What, what type of... Um, incision that did the patient um, does the person have okay where is the incision you're going to tell them what type of drains how many drains if you tell a person two and they come back with one maybe a drain came out between the person being transferred from PACU to us okay so we want to tell them how many drains we want to, they, we want the um we want to tell the nurse that's receiving the patient the different type of medications that the person may have received okay of course, we're going to tell them what type of IV fluids. Sometimes in the PACU, the person can receive um, break do breakthrough doses of pain medication. If you're about to transfer a patient from the PACU to the floor, 
you need to let that nurse know when's the last time you gave that person pain medication. We don't want to give a person pain medication too early, and we don't want to take too long giving the person the next dose of pain medication. So we need to know the last time that person received pain medication. It's a good idea to know where the IV sites are. Okay, So we're going to provide that person all that information when we're giving them report. So, question. Um, the primary nursing goal in the immediate post-operative post -operative period is maintenance of pulmonary function for prevention of laryng um, laryngeal spasms. Laryngeal spasms. Okay. All right. So, that was false. The primary nursing goal in the immediate post-operative period is maintenance of pulmonary function and prevention of hypoxemia and hypercapnia, not laryngeal spasms. Now, that was in your book. It may have been like in the first sentence, 463. 463. Hypoxemia because the person is not breathing effectively enough. Okay, they're not taking, they're, they, they don't have full ventilation. And so... Why does hypercapnia develop? Too much carbon dioxide. And so we know that occurs when we're not fully ventilating, right? So we're not fully inhaling and exhaling. So this is what, this is what we um, look for in the immediate postoperative period, not laryngeal spasms. Now, we can have some laryngeal spasms when that person is extubated. But when the person is still intubated, we look for hypoxemia, hypercapnia. Now, um, with outpatient surgery, um, as we said, um, with our discharge planning, discharge planning begins um, when we admit this person, when we admit the patient. And so we're going to um, provide education early to our patient. Um, hopefully we're providing this education to our patient and the family member because usually, as we said before, after the surgery, the patient is still going to be groggy, groggy, and of course the person is not going to be able to drive. Um, and usually they're not going to receive or remember anything that you tell them. So we want to make sure that we've given the person some type of information in the preoperative period. Also, we can provide this person with, with written instructions because, again, anything that we tell them verbally, they may not remember. So we want to make sure that we're giving them um, written instructions as well that relates to wound care, any activity, medications, and the diet. Okay, and so we always make sure that we give the person um, their prescriptions and phone numbers. If the person has any questions, well, they need to know who to call to um, address those questions to or those concerns. And prescriptions, again, usually we're going to give those to a family member because the person that's still sleeping may not remember where they put those things. So we want to make sure that we give them, of course, the written instructions that tell them what to do, how to dress their wound what activities to avoid, when they can resume normal activities. We have to make sure that we give them information regarding those things. Now, before we discharge this person, it has a peer discharge assessment. So what are some things, if this is an ambulatory patient, outpatient surgery, what do you think our discharge assessment is going to include? We want to make sure that they void it. Okay, that's one thing. What else? Hmm? We want to make sure that they're able to walk. What else? I heard it. somebody said vital signs. We want to make sure that the vital signs are stable. What about if the person has a dressing? Okay. So hopefully we've done that preoperatively. We've got those instructions. We have those things written down. But what about the dressing? Why would I even assess a dressing before the person leaves? Yeah, if it's heavily saturated, there may be something going on. This person may have to go back to surgery. So we need to check that dressing, monitor that dressing, and make sure that the family knows to monitor it as well, to check it for um, excessive bleeding. Um, what else? Bowel sounds. Bowel sounds. Who said that? Okay. So 
why do we want to because this person has not eaten in six to eight hours or 12 hours when they wake up what are they going home to do eat, eat. so can this person leave if the bowel sounds are not present no 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 we've got to make sure that the stomach or the gi tract is awake before they leave right before they leave and eat okay so we got to make sure that the person has had a return of bowel sounds. If this person was intubated, we need to make sure what they can make that they can swallow, and we do that by checking for what a gag reflex. Okay. We want to give instructions to the patient or responsible adult who will accompany the patient. We talked about that. Patients are not to drive home. Um, or be discharged to home alone. And so hopefully they have somebody to drive them home. Um, sedation, anesthesia, again, they're going to cloud judgment, um, going to cloud the, men, the um, person's memory. Um, and it's going to affect the person's ability to make rational decisions, of course. So we want to make sure that they are not driving home. Okay. When we're maintaining, the, uh, maintaining a patent airway, our primary considerations here, again, it says necessary to maintain ventilation and oxygen, oxygenation. Your book shows the different positionings for a person coming out of um, surgery, making sure that the person's tongue is not blocking the airway, okay? We want to supply, um, provide supplemental oxygen as needed. We want to assess breathing by placing a hand near the face to feel for movement of air. Okay, um, And this is if we don't really see the chest rising and falling because the respiratory system is still asleep. We want to see if this, we want to feel if this person actually has air movement. We're going to apply O2 SAT monitor. Even if those respirations aren't full where well, we can see them, is this person still moving air? If not, this person may require more oxygen, okay? Um, we want to keep the head of bed, the head of the bed elevated 15 to 30 degrees unless it's contraindicated, depending on the type of surgery that the person may have had. The person may have to be flat in bed. But if it's not contraindicated, we want it 15 to 30 degrees, they may require suctioning. We talked about when we're preparing our room, we may have suction at bedside because the person may have some nausea and vomiting. And if the person vomits, then we turn the person to their side so that this um, decreases the risk of aspiration. When we um, talk about maintaining cardiovascular status, we're monitoring all indicators of cardiovascular status. What we're concerned with, once the person returns from surgery, if it was an invasive surgery, we worry about um, shock at this point. Um, and one of our indicators, uh, early indicators of shock is hypotension. Okay, and so we want to monitor the person's blood pressure. As I said, we're going to always make sure that we're comparing our current set of vitals to the baseline set of vitals. And so we've got to monitor for potential hypotension because this could mean that the person is starting to develop shock. There's a potential for hemorrhage. What hemorrhage does is put the person at risk again for shock. We want to monitor for hypertension and any dysrhythmias that could occur as side effects of the anesthesia. Hypertension can also develop as one of those mechanisms uh, as a result of the person having pain. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring for, monitoring for that. We, the person could develop electrolyte disturbances as a result of not eating. So we want to make sure that we're monitoring for all of those things. And we know that we have dysrhythmias when we have a person with low calcium, a person with low potassium, high potassium. We have a person that can develop dysrhythmias. So our indicators of hypovolemic shock, shock, hypovolemic means low volume, okay? And so a person that's coming from surgery, the thing that usually causes their volume to be low is blood loss, okay? So what some of our indicators of hypovolemic shock, pallor, that means that the skin becomes pale, well, we've lost blood. Cool, moist skin, 
rapid respiration, cyanosis, that rapid weak thready pulse. So we talked about this maybe like on the first day. Why is the pulse rapid yet weak and thready? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay. All righty. So y'all remember very good. All right. So re a, a rapid weak thready pulse. Heart still trying to perfuse the body at a rapid rate, but there's less pressure. So there's a weak thready pulse. The blood pressure decreases. And then the person has concentrated urine. Now, the reason that we see the symptoms, the pallor, the cool, moist skin, um, the concentrated urine, what happens is when the body senses um, decrease in fluid volumes, the heart says, I still have a job to do. But it's going to perfuse the important organs first. Okay, so it's going to make sure that the brain is perfused. And so the skin is one of those organs we don't really worry about. The heart is most concerned with our organs like the liver. Okay, and so the person is going to have concentrated urine because it may shine away from the um away from the kidneys, but we're going to make sure that we're perfusing the important organs. All of them are important, but some are a little more important. Okay. We're going to relieve pain and anxiety, um, assess the patient's comfort level. We want to make sure that it's not a noisy environment. We want to administer analgesics as indicated, um, usually short-acting opiate IV, opiate IV medications are used. Um, we want to allow the family to visit. We want to deal with any family anxiety. And the way that we decrease family anxiety, again, is letting them know what's going on. The person... Um, Maybe there was a, de a delay with the surgery. They think that the surgery is taking longer, but actually they were delayed in starting the surgery. Just letting them know that the person is okay and that the doctor will be out to talk with them. Um, we want to make sure that the person understands in the preoperative period the importance of letting us know if they're in pain so that we're contro controlling their pain and not letting it get to um, a level that's too intense that the medications that we provide for them won't help. And so we're going to do that. Um, we already talked about nausea and vomiting. We can give medications, um, anti-emetics med anti um, for nausea and vomiting to help control vomiting. Um, Zofran is one of the medications talked about in your book that's given um, to help control nausea. Nausea is one of those things that it's almost worse than vomiting itself. Yeah, so nausea um, is not a good feeling. And so we have medications that we can give the person for that. Um, let's see. Question? The most important nursing intervention when vomiting occurs postoperatively is to turn the person's head to prevent aspiration of vomitus into the lungs. Okay. So what do you think of Bethany? Did you read too much into it? Probably. Okay. I was thinking that if you just turn their head and didn't turn where they connect, then, I mean, if it doesn't come out of their mouth, it can still go up and back down into their lungs. Okay. But again, just a little bit. <laughs> just a little bit. We're going to make sure that we turn their head, okay? Um, okay. With our older patients, we want to make sure that we're um, monitoring them more frequently because they may be more hemodynamically unstable as far as their blood pressure is concerned. Um, we want to make sure um, that we're monitoring their hydration level. And another important thing here is that the person is at, at, at increased risk for post-operative confusion or delirium, and usually this can, can be related to the anesthesia, but we can also see this when the person is not getting enough oxygen, 
Okay, so um, we want to make sure, again, especially in our elderly patient, that we're monitoring the person's O2 sat, we're monitoring the person's hydration. One of the questions that was on your exam that we're going to review about today was maybe, I think it was something about a person, maybe the person was dehydrated, maybe they became confused, and what do we do first? And so we're going to give the person oxygen first. Okay. So you got that one right, very good. We're going to get a person oxygen first. And because, I mean, if you think about it, we said the person is dehydrated, and so that means that the person has lost fluid volume. When we talk about volume, we're talking about blood, okay? And so when a person is dehydrated and not being fused, um, perfused appropriately, well, it affects the brain, and we talk about oxygen loss up here, okay? And so when that person starts to develop that confusion, well... We're going to go ahead and give them some oxygen, okay? Um, let's see. Adequate hydration, we're going to reorient as needed. Um, wound healing, there's a chart in your book where it talks about um, the different types of wound healing. You have, wound, um, you have first intention, second intention, and third intention. And so um, there's a chart in your book that talks about that. With your first intention wound heal, and this is a simple incision. Okay, simple incision. There's minimal tissue disruption. And so these type of incisions can be easily closed with sutures. Maybe sutures and staples easily closed. Okay, with your second intention wound heal, and these are a little bit more, dip, a little different. Um, with the second intention um, wound, these wounds are left open. And you may see some a second intention wound when you have a person that has maybe a decubitus that has developed. Maybe the person is going to go in and have some type of procedure done for that decubitus. What you have sometimes with decubitus is that the tissue starts to die inside of the decubitus and you have tissues that are dead um, they become what we call necrotic and sometimes those tissues have to be debrided and so when we debride them we're pulling out that old tissue so that new tissue can form and that's called granulation tissue and so when we talk about um, something healing by second intention that wound is going to be left open it may be debrided but it's going to left, be left open to allow um, the opportunity for that healthy granulation tissue to fill that area in so what we do when we have a person that comes out to us um, that has a wound that's going to be allowed to heal by second, secondary intention. Again, we said that the wound is left open. You think we can just leave it open and send the person out? No, we've got to pack that wound. And so the book says um, that we're going to use a moist, use moist gauze to pack that wound, and then we're going to cover it with a sterile dressing. Now, the reason that we're going to use a moist, sterile gauze is because we said that we want that area to fill in with healthy granulation tissue. Healthy granulation tissue um, pulls apart easily and it bleeds really easily. Okay, And so what can happen is if we um, put in dry gauze, that dry gauze is going to adhere to that healthy tissue and if we pull it, it's going to pull that tissue and it's also going to make that person bleed more. And so we put in moistened saline gauze into that area. We pack that area with moistened saline gauze and then we cover it. Now, what's going to happen over a couple of hours to that moistened saline gauze? It's going to dry out. So do we just go in and pull that dry gauze out? No, what we do is we resaturate it. We put a little saline back on it, saturate that um, gauze again that's packed inside of it so that it's not pulling that healthy tissue out when we go in to change our dressing, okay? When um, we look at the third intention wound healing, this is when a person has a wide wound. So it's different from a person that, um, when we talk about second intention, it's just, just that these wound edges are too far apart to be drawn together by a suture or staples. 
So it's a wide wound. And so what we do with the third intention wound is that we allow that area to fill in with granulation tissue before we suture it. So we say to the person with third intention, this is a late suture, okay? Um, usually um, in your book it shows you the diagram, the person with the second Second, um, secondary intention, we just allow that to heal a scar itself. The person with third intention, we let granulation tissue fill in, and then we go in and suture those sides together. Because usually with um, a second, secondary intention, the sides aren't going to be well approximated, even if we could put them together. With a third intention, those sides could come together nicely. It's just that the wound is so wide. Okay, so we're going to come back later and suture the person that has a third intention wound. Okay, which of the following occurs during the inflammatory phase of wound healing? Okay, so this was all in your book. The person has a blood clot to form, and that's during the inflammatory phase of wound healing. You have granulation tissue that starts, and so... Um, granulation tissue takes about two to five days to begin in a wound. It doesn't take a real long time for granulation tissue to begin to form in a wound. These are the different types of surgical drains that you may see your patient come out um, from surgery with. Um, at the top here, you see um, this is called a hemovac drain. And down here is an example of a Jackson Pratt drain. And so um, the best way for me to describe a hemovac drain, if you think of an accordion, you know, you, you squeeze the accordion together. Mm -hmm. Is that an accordion that mm -hmm. kind of squeezes? Mm -hmm. Okay. That's kind of the idea of a hemovac drain. The way that you create suction for a hemovac drain is you squeeze the accordion or squeeze the hemovac together. There's a little opening right here. So you have the opening. You open the hemovac drain. You squeeze those sides together and close it. And so that's creating what? Suction, right? And so that's how we create suction on a hemovac drain so that it pulls the um, extra fluid out. You know, if we have an area that has too much blood or too much fluid, it can't heal properly, okay? So that's the reason for hemovac drains. We have to pull that excess blood out of that area. Now, with the Jackson Pratt drain, you see here it says that it has a little stopper right here, okay? And this is the drainage bottle. It's kind of the same thing with the Jackson Pratt. You open the stopper. You're going to drain whatever is inside of it, and then you squeeze the sides of the stopper. You squeeze the sides of the drainage bottle together, plug it back up, and so that's going to create the suction again. And so our responsibility when we have patients with hemovacs, of course, and with Jackson Pratt drains is that we have to drain them or empty them on a regular basis, and we have to make sure that we're documenting how much we empty from the hemovac and the Jackson Pratt drains. Okay, so our post-operative dressings, the reason that we have dressings to provide a healing environment, of course. We want to protect them so that microorganisms are not allowed to get into the wound bed. We want to absorb any excess drainage. We use our post-operative dressings to splint or immobilize. We talked about that, especially with a person that has abdominal surgery. We want to protect that area. We want to provide hemostasis. And what's that? My blood clotting. Everything's in balance. That's homeostasis. Oh, what's blood <laughs> hemostasis is, stasis is we're stopping something, we're staying it. Hemo means blood. And so we want to stop blood at that area, promote hemostasis. And that does say homeostasis. That should be hemostasis. I'm sorry. That does say hemostasis. Hemostasis. Okay. And also to provide the patient with physical and mental comfort. Okay. Just covering it so they're not looking at it and they're not panicking. 
We want to just cover it for their physical and mental comfort. Now, when we're changing the post-operative dressing, the very first dressing is changed by a member of the surgical team. And so what I've always learned is that you never change the first dressing. The surgeon, surgeon or a person from his team is the first person to change a post-op dressing. Unless they tell you to, you don't touch it. Okay, if you have a person that has a post-operative dressing that is um, heavily saturated, that's something that we need to let them know. Okay, if the person has maybe some drainage, or if it, you know, if it's if we may need to reinforce it, put another four by four on it and retape it. We can reinforce, um, but we usually don't remove the first dressing. Um, we need to know the types of dressing materials. Of course, we're going to wash our hands and maintain sterile technique. Whenever we're changing a dressing, we always want to make sure we're assessing the wound. A wound assessing the wound. Um, anytime we see black, that's not good. We're looking for pus. We're assessing the wound and also around the wound to see if there's increased redness or warmth in that area because those are signs of infection. So that's what we're monitoring our wound for. We want to apply the dressing and tape. We want to include the person, the patient's response. We always want to make sure that we're um, providing teaching when we're doing any type of dressing change. And of course we document because if we didn't document it, we didn't do it. So um, also what you want to do when you're changing the dressing, I, we always um, tell you to autograph it. You're going to put your name on that dressing, and you're also going to put the time and the date that you changed that dressing so that the next nurse knows when it was done and when the next one is to be done. Um, do um, frequent vital signs. Um, we already talked about the 15 minutes. Um, we're going to assess the person at least every four hours, always assessing airway, respirations. Now that we're in the post-operative period, now we're going to tell the person to use that incentive, use that incentive spirometer. This is the time that that person, if, the, if it's not contraindicated, the person is going to do that diaphragmatic breathing. This is the time now the person is in bed. We're going to tell that person to do those leg exercises. These are some different diagnoses that are associated in the post-operative period, risk for constipation, um, impaired skin integrity, activity intolerance, risk for injury, anxiety. Um, the person is at risk for um, pulmonary infection. One of my um, most memorable patients, um, I don't even remember what type of procedure she had. All I know is that she was young and she kept complaining of pain. And so because she was in pain, she would not use her incentive spirometer. So I want to say day one, she got away with it. Day two, she was in the ICU. She developed atelectasis because she would not cough and deep breathe or use that incentive spirometer. So, um... It is real. It does happen. If you don't get that stuff out of your lungs and you don't cough and you don't open those airways back up effectively, they're going to collapse. Okay? So we want to always make sure that we're teaching the turning, the coughing, and the deep breathing. Um, deep vein thrombosis, we know how we help a person to avoid that. Um, we talked about the anti, um, the TED hose. Um, we have sequential devices. Um, these are the pumps that we'll put on the patient's legs, and so they help to improve and increase circulation. Um, with a hematoma or hemorrhage, I had another patient to come back from having uh, some type of calf procedure where they um, use the femoral route. The patient came out. She was okay. Vitals were okay. Went back in the room. Um, her blood pressure had dropped. She was asking me to call her daughter. She said, I don't feel right. Something is not right. I pull the covers back, and it's a pool of, a pool of blood in the person's bed. Mm -hmm. So what do I do as a nurse? Do I run out of the room, call the doctor? No, I can't do that yet, okay? I've got to open my IV fluids up, get her some fluid, lift the, lift the bottom of her bed, 
elevate her legs because I want that blood that she does have going back to her heart, okay? So there are some things that we have to do at the bedside as nurses before we run out and call the doctor. Somebody else can call the doctor for me while I'm, while I'm doing her bed and call the nurse and I'm opening up the IV fluids and I've turned her oxygen all the way up, okay? Because I've got to make sure that she's got oxygen. I've got to make sure that I've reestablish her fluid volume okay so um we've always got to make sure that we're monitoring any type of dressing any type of um incision site that our person may have um when they come back to us from surgery when we talk about wound dehiscence and wound um evisceration one is when the wound just pops back open okay and so which one is that one the dehiscence and evisceration is when the person actually has um, bowel or intestines coming through that wound. And so what we're going to do is if this occurs, if the person um, develops evisceration, then we're going to lower the person's, um, lower the head of the bed. We're going to um, cover that area with a sterile dressing, okay, it was saturated sterile dressing. And then we can go call the doctor, okay. But before we run out and panic, we got to make sure our patient is safe, okay? So we lower the head of the bed because what is lowering the head of the bed going to do if the intestines have come out? Okay, so it's going to help them to relax back into the abdominal wall, okay? So we're going to lower the head of the bed, tell the person if at all possible to avoid coughing because coughing makes it come back out. We're going to cover that area and call the doctor because this is one of those things that have to be fixed pretty quickly. And so that's the end.